Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Full Momentum and HEC RAS podcast. I'm your host, Ben Carey, and joining me as always today on this, I guess, three days to Thanksgiving is Chris Goodell. Uh, Chris, it's been about a month. Uh, it's been, been a little bit, been a busy month, but uh, how you been? Yeah, crazy busy. Um, boy, it's hard to work these vodcasts in, huh? Being so busy with the work. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we're going to try and keep doing these and, and keep them coming as, as frequently as possible. But yeah, if you don't see us for a while, it's just all it means is we're busy, very <laughs> busy. And uh, this is the time of year too, right? Thanksgiving, then uh, the uh, Christmas holiday season and, and everything just gets a little bit crazy and wacky. Yep. Yeah, so. exactly. And uh, I know that we've, we've been very busy. I think the last podcast, uh, or I should say the previous podcast we recorded, um, two months after the the one before that. So we're getting a little bit better here, only being about a month apart. But we're hoping yeah. that after the holidays wrap back up, Chris and I will be back into this uh, on a bi-monthly basis. But for now, uh, this is this is what you guys get. So I hope everybody yeah. is excited for the holiday season coming up here. Um, today we have a really cool episode. We're going to kind of build off our... Um, our emphasis on 2D areas uh, over the last couple episodes. In episode nine, we talked about um, upcoming uh, FEMA floodway mapping uh, in 2D and kind of the develop most recent developments developments with that. Uh, in episode 10, we had an episode discussing um, whether to use 2D or 1D models. It was called 2D or not 2D, and we went through <laughs> an exercise of identifying different situations. Um, in which 2D modeling would be would be ideal, or if 1D modeling would be uh, adequate for that particular situation. And uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about kind of setting up and building a 2D model from start to finish, uh, running a simulation. Uh, if that's something that you guys are interested in, um, so we got it. Yeah, it'll be a it'll be a good episode. Um, but before we get into that, Chris, just wanted to ask you um, on the spot. This isn't something we talked about, but what is uh, with, with with Thanksgiving coming up here? I wanted to know what your favorite. You have to pick one. No cop outs here. Your favorite um, food related to Thanksgiving. Oh wow, yeah, put me on the spot, Ben. Um, <laughs> gosh, you know, I honestly a well done turkey for me is hard to beat. Hard to beat. I really love the stuffing too um i could i could eat a lot of that but a really good well done turkey just juicy and flavorful uh it's hard for me to beat that so i'm gonna go with turkey with uh you know some good gravy to go on top of it nice. um uh, second place would be the stuffing how about you yeah mine's a little outside the box uh you know obviously i enjoy all the traditional thanksgiving foods um, as much as anybody else, but my favorite, definitely my favorite part of Thanksgiving is cranberry sauce, which is a little bit uh, unique. Uh, it's not definitely, really. it, it's not on the top so. of most people's list, but um, it seems like it's one of the old, you know, I don't, I don't think I ever eat cranberry sauce except for on Thanksgiving, maybe Christmas, but um, yeah, I just, I really like the tartness of it. Um, and I'm a fruit guy. So, so I got to ask you, do you put it on your turkey? Cause First time I heard about somebody doing that, I thought that was uh, that was insane, sacrilegious. How could you do that to your turkey? But yeah. some people love it on their turkey. In my opinion, if you have to put cranberry sauce on your turkey, it's a bad turkey. But <laughs> 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 that's just me. Uh, no, I'm definitely a. Um, I like to eat every element of the Thanksgiving meal separate. Like some people like to kind of throw everything on a plate and mix it all together and eat it. I like to keep everything clean and separate uh, yeah that's my yeah. personality that, type that's the engineer in you i think you know <laughs> yeah. it's nice and segmented and logical yeah right in yep. perfect order right yeah yep. yep. yeah and it i actually I, I like to think that i eat my thanksgiving dinner a lot like i build my 2d models kind of organized one step at a time <laughs> um and if it's if you know how to do it right uh it'll it'll come out well so i love that 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 could be another quote for the class build your model like your thanksgiving dinner <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Not man>. to, <laughs> yeah keep it simple keep it yep. simple only put on there what you need yep. you know yep. then add things as you go right yeah yep. add complexity yep. as you go so let me ask you about the cranberry sauce because i'm fascinated by this 
Um, not really, but a little bit. Um, <laughs> are you a, are you a, like the, the real like homemade cranberry sauce? Or are you like out of the can, cut it in slices, cranberry sauce guy? Yeah, I'm definitely a homemade, um, uh, uh, makes homemade cranberry sauce. So I, I don't really like the stuff that's a little bit more like gelatin, jello. Yeah. 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 I yeah. like, I like the real deal. Um, to me, that's, that's the best stuff. That's, that's what yeah. I grew up on though, was the can and the slices. Like yeah. we would, we would get a, a disc of cranberry <laughs> sauce and, yeah. uh, my mom will kill me because <laughs> if she ever watches this, but, uh, <laughs> but that's what she made. And I thought that was normal until I went to Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, I think at my wife's parents' house when we weren't before we were married, and they brought out this like bowl of actual sauce, and I was like, "What is this? Oh, that's cranberry sauce. Really? It's not in the shape of a disc. How strange!" <laughs> mm -hmm. But now I realize how strange the uh, the canned cranberry sauce really is. But anyway, yeah. I could go for both, honestly, but I do like the homemade stuff better. Very good. Yeah. So anyone who's listening to this podcast, along with any questions you may have about the technical side of this aspect, we'd encourage you to uh, comment in what your favorite part of Thanksgiving dinner is. We'd love to hear what different uh, different users around the country enjoy about Thanksgiving most from a culinary standpoint. Um, aside from the food this year, uh, there's something very exciting happening for me Thanksgiving morning, uh, and that is my alma mater, Gonzaga, uh, where their basketball team is ranked uh, number one in the country going into the start of this year. Uh, <laughs> and everybody who's following college basketball right now knows how precarious uh, the season start is right now. I know there's a lot of games being canceled left and right, but we're, we're still optimistic that we'll be able to play some basketball and eventually have some tournament. And I know on Thanksgiving morning, Gonzaga is slated to play uh, University of Kansas, who are coming in ranked at number six this year. So this isn't a college basketball podcast as much as I would like it to be. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, to my alma mater a couple days before they play a big game on Thanksgiving. Well, you know, maybe you can get some of the, uh, the viewers out there, the uh, Full Momentum viewers, to uh, give you a little good mojo, some good vibes, <laughs> get Gonzaga over the top, and keep that number one ranking as long as possible, right? That would be that all would be the ideal. way to the championship. That would be ideal. That would make uh, <laughs> that would make a pretty good twenty start of twenty twenty one compared to how twenty twenty's gone. So, you know, my uh, Oregon State Beavers were ranked number one a long, long time ago. <laughs> well, in baseball, there's they've been ranked back before uh, one number one. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. But even basketball back before I went to school there, they were actually really good and were ranked number one. And uh, and then they were cursed by it and ended up going out in the first round, I think. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, those are the breaks. So it's a yeah, era. we're looking at looking forward to Thanksgiving for a number of different reasons: the food, there's gonna be some sports, some time with family. Um, so yeah, it should be should be good. But before we get too far down the road there, um, this is a heck. This is a HEC Raz podcast, and we do have an exciting topic for today. But before we jump into that. I want to just give a quick shout out to our sponsor for this episode, um, who is our firm, Kleinschmidt Associates. Kleinschmidt is known throughout the industry as a firm that provides practical solutions to complex problems affecting energy, water, and the environment. You can learn more at kleinschmidtgroup.com. So as always, thank you, Kleinschmidt, for sponsoring this episode. Yeah. yeah. And, yep. You know what's great about Kleinschmidt? They give us logo bucks, and so we can get this cool gear <laughs> like this for free. Like there I just go. got this package of uh, three new sweatshirts and a big old blanket. So um, thanks, Klein Schmidt. Awesome. Okay. Shout out to Klein Schmidt. <laughs> All right, Chris. So for today's episode, again, we're going to talk through kind of a 2D model setup. And for those of you guys who follow the the vodcast pretty um, uh, pretty devotedly, you will remember that. Way back in episode five, we covered building 2D model elements in RAS Mapper. And so this uh, particular podcast is going to focus more on uh, building a 2D model from start to finish, specifically using the geometric data editor as opposed to RAS Mapper. Um, so, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of walk through this and then I'll yeah. periodically chime in where needed. And uh, we should have a good little conversation about this this morning. Well, this will be a great uh, thing to try out 
on Thanksgiving after you've eaten all of your food and you're just sitting there digesting it all, or maybe the next day, maybe Friday, if you got that day off and you want to do a little practicing with your heck uh, this will help you know how to set up a basic 2D model, which is what we're going to do today. And I want to give a shout out to Sotiris Tsitsilonis of Greece. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, he sent me an email today and said, hey, you know, it would be great if you guys just did a quick, this is how you set up a 2D model, start to finish, just a basic one. And I thought that's a great idea. That'd make a great podcast. So here we are doing just that very thing. So let me get my screen up there so you can all see it. And what I've done here is I've started with the Bald Eagle Creek data set. And uh, I'm going to um, make this a little bit easier for everybody to see by changing my display settings. By the way, if you ever have to give a presentation, I highly recommend doing this, changing your display settings so that people can see your RAS model a little bit better. Always come down to this 1280 plus by 720. And uh, that seems to, to do it just right. So let's see if that, oh, that was the wrong screen. Never mind. Let's go back. I should have done this ahead of time, Ben. My apologies, everybody. All right, let's get the right monitor. That's this one here. There we go. That's what I like. Okay, keep those changes. All right. So now you should be able to see my uh, my main RAS window very easily. And I just took the Bald Eagle Creek data set which everybody gets with HECRAS. So you could do this very same thing with the exact same data set, the same terrain and everything. Just follow along with the podcast here. What I did first is I went in and I started a new geometry, just a blank geometry, nothing's in here, absolutely brand new. And first thing you always wanna do when you're setting up a 2D model is you want to establish your projection and your terrain. Um, those are both needed for doing a 2D model. And so I'm going to get into RAS Mapper really quick, which is where you do that. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because we covered it in previous podcasts. Uh, but I just want to quickly review how you get your projection set up and how you get your terrain set up. And so in RAS Mapper, under the Tools menu item, you'll see this Set Projection for Project. So make sure you get that established. Now, because this is the Bald Eagle Creek data set that comes with RAS, it's already established in here. You can see we've got this projection. So we're good to go there. Everything's all projected well. And then we just need to get our terrain in. Now notice there's a terrain already in here. So I don't need to bring in another terrain with a new geometry model if this is the terrain I wanna use. I can just adopt this as my terrain. If I did wanna bring in a new terrain or create a new terrain, you could just right click on here and say either create a new terrain or add an existing terrain that you already have somewhere else. But I'm just going to adopt this terrain for my new geometry. And the way you do that is you go up to the geometries group, right click on it, manage new geometry associations, and here's where you can now link up this terrain with the new geometry. Now, RAS has this thing where if there's only one terrain, it will just assume that's the one you want to link up. So it does that automatically for you. All you have to do is click OK here, and you'll see that I've got my terrain 50 already set up with my simple 2D area, which is the new geometry I just uh, put together. So if I press close here and I close this, now I've got my terrain and it pops in here because I've got that already turned on as a background layer here, plot terrain. So here we've got, I call this our uh, kind of a blank canvas. Um, we can draw anything on here and, um, and make a model out of it basically. And the easiest type of model to set up when you have a terrain is a 2D model because literally you just draw a 2D area, tell it, Raz, what size cells you want, give it an end value, and you're done. That's all the geometry you have to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus in on this area over here. Always fascinated by this uh, Pennsylvania terrain here with all these uh, ridges that run parallel to each other. And you can see how uh, in geologic time, how water is kind of cut through these ridges like that. 
Um, here's one particular basin. I want to make a 2D area out of this. I'm just going to model this thing by itself. So let me zoom out a little bit and get a better zoom right here. Okay, and um, move that out of the way. We don't need that over here. And when you're ready to put in a 2D area, you've got your terrain and projection. You're ready to go. In the geometry window, all you have to do is click on this 2D flow area button up here. Now you're in drawing mode. You'll see my cursor is turned into a pencil. I can just draw my 2D area wherever I like to. And I'm going to draw it around this basin here. Now, you can see there's a little tributary right in this area. So I'm going to draw my 2D area to kind of cross that perpendicular. That's, that's what you want to do when you've got an inflow boundary. Or an okay. outflow boundary as well. Or an outflow, correct. And you don't have to be super precise about how you draw it, but you want to make sure you get it wide enough so that water does not touch the boundary of your 2D area, except where you have these inflow or outflow locations. Before you finish that too, Chris, I think it's really helpful. This is a little trick for folks that aren't um, maybe do a lot, don't do a lot of 2D drawing in the geometric data editor. But if you are zoomed into the level you are right now and you wanted to pan from left to right in that space, a really easy way to do that is just to uh, right click on your mouse um, yeah. and it'll automatically move your view window to the left or to the right. And that that's really helpful because for anybody who's drawn in the geometric data editor, if you ever try to zoom in or out, um, you know, using your toggle or anything like that, uh, it can really jack up your your view space. And so really the only way that's to right. move around when you're drawing is to use that right click. So. Yeah, it's a little unfortunate part of the geometry window and you have to get used to that. But yeah, if I wanted to maybe recenter my view right here because I've run out of room, I could just right click and it would just move that over there and I'm recentered and I can keep clicking yep. uh, with my left click after that. The other thing too is I see this all the time in our class. You probably do too, Ben, where people will want to zoom in or zoom out and they use their mouse wheel. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, watch what happens. Uh oh, now I'm totally screwed up. What happened? Ah, now uh, my 2D area is screwed up and some people think they have to start over. Actually, if you if this happens and you see that you've done this, don't left click, but right click, just like we talked about recentering, but right clicking when you're in this weird zone like this will bring you back to where you were and kind of reset it. Now I can recenter myself too by right clicking again right here and I'm still connected. All right, so now I'm ready to close my 2D area. I always tell people to leave a little bit of gap between your last point and your first point, because if I try to hit it right on there, I could actually overlap a little bit, and that might give you a weird shape um, where it's connecting. So just leave a little gap, and RAS will straight line connect it to close your polygon. So double click to end it, and it's going to ask for a name. I'll just call this uh, basin for lack of a better name here. And now I've got my 2D area basin and we're ready to start um, adding in our, our parameters for our 2D area. And so to do that, you can go over here and click this 2D flow area button, or I like to just left click in the geometry uh, window. You left click to select things. I'll left click on it and go to edit 2D flow area. And this brings up the 2D flow area editor. Uh, notice here, there's a message. Current mesh contains no computation points. That's because we have not added in any cell center points. And so that's really the first thing I usually do is I come in here, click this button that says generate computation points. And that allows you to define the DX and DY spacing of your computation points. Those, so this is technically not the size of your cells but it's the spacing between cell center points. Of course, if you have just straight square cells, then that would be the same. Your, your distance between cell center points and the size of your cells would be the same. But it's important to understand the distinction because what you're doing here in this step is you're laying out an array of cell center points or computation points spaced at 400, in this case, we're doing US units, so 400 feet in the X direction and 400 feet in the Y direction. Leave this alone. There's no need to, to, to have a shift to the right or up. The only time this is ever used, to my understanding, I've never actually used it for a project, but if, if you're trying to replicate a, a mesh that is in maybe say another uh, software program, 
um, and they have a particular shifting to the right or to up, uh, to the, to up or down. You can put in a number in here, but generally you'll leave that as zeros. And then just click this generate points. And now I've got 7,092 cells in here. It won't show up until I close this window, but I'm gonna leave it open and go through the stuff on the left here. This is our default Manning's end value. You have to have something in here. And this is the value that RAS will use if you don't have coverage by another Manning's end means, say uh, Manning's end layer or refinement regions. Anywhere you don't have Manning's coverage, it will default to this value. That's why it's called the default Manning's end value. That ensures that RAS will never crash for lack of having an end value assigned. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to, and in the case of a simple model like right here, you could just apply this single end value to the entire 2D area and it will work. Now that's real, not realistic. Um, normally you're gonna have some varying land use and land classifications within a 2D area. And so you'd probably wanna bring in Manning's end layers, but for a real simple, quick exercise, you could just go with this default. Now- and I'll, I'll yeah. add to you for, for anybody who's interested in learning more about um, you know, using a Manning's end layer for a 2D model or adding override regions, we cover that in depth in episode eight of this podcast. So if that's something you're interested, go back a few episodes, episode eight, and that's what we talk about in depth. So just a little note for folks. <clears throat> yeah, good point. Um, now these parameters down here, while they look very important and there's six of them, don't touch them, leave them alone. OK, if you don't know what it is, just leave them alone, because these work very well for all modeling applications. Uh, if you wanted to get into the academic side of things and the theory of it and try some things out, maybe you start messing around with these. But for most applications, just leave these alone. Now, if you happen to accidentally change this and it goes outside of the applicability range or the range that RAS allows for them, then you're gonna get an error message. And if you don't know what that error message means, it might be hard to figure it out. So le just leave these alone. All you do is put in your cell center points here with this button and your Manning's end value and then click okay. When I do this, you'll see now I have a mesh here. Now, it looks like the cells are a little bit diagonal. That's only because I'm zoomed out for the um, resolution of the mesh. If I zoom in, you'll notice I can now see the actual cells in their uh, very structured Cartesian uh, layout. And the only time you have a non-square cell in here is along the border where it has to make these weird shapes to fit the uh, perimeter. Otherwise, we've got a very structured mesh in here. And there's about 7,000 cells, which is a good number. If you start getting uh, up in the 100,000 range, then your models are gonna take maybe several minutes to run. If you get into the million range plus, you might be looking at hours. And of course, it depends on how long of a simulation you run too. But for your typical, you know, one or two day simulation, um, you know, try to try to keep it around 10,000 or less if you can. And that's going to give you a very fast, efficient, snappy running model. All right. So now we've got our 2D area here. And I mentioned I want to simulate inflow here at this tributary. And I want to also simulate outflow here where it breaks through this ridge line. So to do that, I need to put in a boundary condition line. So up here, you'll see this button that says SA2D area BC lines. BC stands for boundary condition lines. I'm just going to click on this. I'm going to draw my BC line. Now, here's my inflow location. What you want to do for an inflow or outflow BC line is draw it just outside of the perimeter. You don't want to try and draw it on the perimeter because you might actually go inside of the 2D area and that's gonna cause a little bit of conflict. RAS won't quite understand if it's supposed to be an internal or an external boundary condition. So give it a little, a healthy bit of room like you see I'm doing right here and double click to end it. I always draw mine left to right, although I don't think it necessarily matters for BC lines, but it's a good practice to get into. Left to right as if you're looking in the downstream direction. I'm gonna call this my inflow, keep it very generic. That's my inflow boundary condition line. Then I'm gonna do the same thing for my outflow. And I'm gonna call this outflow. Notice again, I drew left to right looking in the downstream direction. 
Okay, so now I've got two BC lines and RAS will automatically snap those to the closest cell face points on your 2D mesh. So it does that for you. And you know that you've got it established because you've got this red and black line right here. So we're good so to I go. Know, I know one question that might come up from people that are watching this video, Chris, is how wide do you want to draw um, that boundary condition line? So for instance, if you zoom into the downstream boundary condition connection line, um, and just kind of look at where you have that line drawn compared to the actual, what appears to be the channel itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's a natural question that people ask, well, how wide do I want to draw that? Do I want to draw it just inside of the channel? Do I want it over that, uh, you know, outside of that channel area? What would be your recommendation for that? Yeah, well, the, the answer is you want it to be wide enough that it covers the full width of flow going through here. Now, if all the flow is contained in just this little amount at the highest peak discharge, then you'd only have to draw your, your BC line from here to here, let's say, a little bit of overlap. I don't really know. Uh, I'm doing this on the fly. This is the first time I'm putting this together. I'm not quite sure if it's going to overtop these high ground features or not. I'm assuming it's going to go between here. So I just gave it a little healthy bit of overlap and that's fine to have more. You'd rather have more than not enough uh, length to your BC line. Um, if there's no water over here, it's, it's not going to send water through that BC line. And I'll explain to you why when we get into the flow editor here in just a second. Perfect. Yeah. Good question though. Um, yeah, that's a common one that comes up. <clears throat> and then the same thing on the inflow boundary. So I'm actually ready to go. This is all I need in my geometry to make this model run. Now, it's not necessarily gonna be the best 2D model in the world. It's not gonna cover all the problems you may need to address for a really well built model, but this will run like it is right here. Okay, so I'm gonna save this and um, I'm gonna set up my flow file. All right, so I've got my geometry set. Now I just need to, to go into my flow file. So I'll go back to the main window and 2D models are always on steady flow. Even if you're wanting to simulate a steady state condition, you still have to run it through unsteady flow, which means you have to use the unsteady flow editor, not the steady flow editor. So we'll go into unsteady flow. <clears throat> And this is a brand new unsteady flow area I've set up called Simple 2D Area. You can see it's already recognizing my BC lines, my outflow and my inflow. For my inflow, I'm just going to click over here and I'm going to select a flow hydrograph. And I'm going to make this a quasi steady. So it's representing steady flow conditions, but we're running it in the unsteady flow editor. And so the way you do that is just putting in constant discharges for a certain period of time. So I'm going to put in 50,000 cubic feet per second. If you're interested what that is in SI units, divide it by 35, and that roughly gives you the cubic meters per second equivalent. But I'm going to run it for one day and see if that's long enough to get to steady state conditions. So I go down to 24 hours for one day. I'll put in 50,000. And then there's this uh, convenient interpolate tool, which will fill in the rest of the blank cells in between. And there we go. We've got 50,000. Some people just like to change this data time interval to say one year or one month or one week or whatever. And then you just have to put a 50,000 here and here. But, you know, however you want to do it, you can do it. Now, for a 2D area, when you have a flow hydrograph, don't forget about the EG slope. You have to put this value in. It's kind of hiding down at the bottom, so it's really easy to forget. I forget about it all the time, but this is required when you have a 2D area. If this is a BC line for a 2D area. All this energy grade slope does is it uses Manny's equation to figure out how to distribute that 50,000 CFS over that BC line, there's several cells along that BC line, it's gonna distribute that 50,000. It doesn't make sense to distribute it uniformly, right? Because we have some really high, high elevated features over on the side, which probably won't have any flow. And so you want that flow to be concentrated where you have the highest amount of conveyance. And so that's what this EG slope does for us automatically. So the way you might uh, figure that out is you could go, I could go back to the geometry window and let me zoom in here at my inflow location. And I'm gonna measure 
by holding the control key down, notice what happens to my cursor. It changes from an arrow to a measuring tool. And I'm just going to click points down the, the thou egg of this channel as best as I can. Doesn't have to be perfectly accurate, but you want enough points that you can maybe get an idea of what the slope is. And when I release the control key, it's going to give me some information, including the slope. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't yeah, know if that that's measured. not the right slope. That's not yeah. the right slope. Yeah, you have to cut the profile from the terrain. Yeah, yeah. Don't use this slope. This is good if you're looking in profile view, but not in plan view. Yeah. Okay, because this is actually the slope of the coordinate points, <clears throat> not not of the terrain. So we yeah. want to cut from the profile from the terrain and plot it and then get my slope off of this. And actually, this is a really nice looking slope. Usually, I don't get one that well. So I'm just going to eyeball this and say it's about 4,000 feet here. And we've got a drop of about, let's see, 120 feet. So 120 feet over 4,000. You do the math really quick, Matt, uh, Ben. One, what did I say, 120 feet mm -hmm. over 4,000? That's 0 0.03. So I have a slope of 0 0.03. So I'm just going to use that. And this doesn't have to be perfectly accurate either. It's not super sensitive. It's just for distributing the flow. OK, so now I've got my EG slope there. And uh, let me go back because I've got to put in my downstream or my outflow boundary. And here I'm going to use normal depth and let Raz figure out what the depth should be for whatever flow is passing through there. Again, it's using Manning's equation to figure out this depth. And so I'm going to use, uh, I have to put in a uh, slope. Here they call it friction slope. In the other window, they call it the EG or energy grade slope. It's the same thing. So um, you see some of this stuff in Raz every once in a while where they use different terminology for the same thing. Uh, so don't be confused there. It's the same thing. I can go back to Raz. And I can zoom in, or sorry, the geometry window. I can zoom in here and I can measure this slope again like I did before. I probably want to be a little bit more precise here. So I have a decent looking slope. And plot it. And it's a little bit more difficult, but I can get kind of an average. 620 to 540, that's 80 over 8,000. Ooh, that math works out really <laughs> nice. So that's point... Uh, well, that's zero, zero, 001, right? Correct. I like when the math works out easy. Okay. Now I've got my unsteady flow uh, boundary conditions set up. I still want to think about initial conditions. Now, if I just have a single 2D area, I have two choices for that 2D area. I can start it out with a level pool. So the water level is the same everywhere in the 2D area. That would be good for a reservoir, let's say. Uh, but in this case, um, this is mostly going to be dry ground. Uh, there might be a little bit of water in the creek, but probably not enough to worry about. So I'm going to leave it dry. And the way you leave it dry for your initial elevation is just to leave this blank. So I'm just going to leave it blank. Go save. Now I've got my geometry done. I've got my flow done. All I got to do is set up a plan and we're ready to compute this thing. So to set up your plan, again, this is an unsteady flow model. So go to your unsteady flow analysis window. Click this uh, stick person running uphill or you can go to run unsteady flow analysis. It gets to the same place. And here you can see I've already got my geometry and flow file set up. We've got geometry preprocessor, unsteady flow simulation, and post processor selected. I don't need post processor because 2D areas don't use this. This is only used for 1D, but it doesn't hurt to leave it checked. So I'll usually just leave it checked. And if you remember, I wanted to run a single day of simulation. So I'm going to change this to 02 January 1999. So I'm going from 12 o'clock noon on January 1st, 12 o'clock noon on January 2nd. And what do you think I should use for a computation interval, Ben? Yeah, so whenever you're kind of estimating a computational interview interval, you want to use the current number equation to give yourself an idea um, for what you should use roughly. 
Um, but in this case, since we don't really have an understanding for what the velocities in our 2D model are going to be, you're going to have to take a guess. Um, mm -hmm. And then based on the results, uh, you may want to adjust that time step, either making it smaller or larger. Um, in this case, based on the size of your cells, which are pretty large, um, and the size of your model, I would probably say something around a one minute or 30 second time step would be um, sufficient. I think your instincts are right on target, Ben. Um, I like, like I mentioned before, I like easy math. So I know that my cell size or cell center spacing is 400 feet, right? And so easy math for me is like a round number of 10 for uh, velocity. So we'll say 10 feet per second. That's a little, maybe a little on the high side, but this is a pretty good flood event. So let's say 10 feet per second is the highest velocity I'll have. If you divide 400 by 10, that gives you 40 seconds. Right. So you're right there, Ben, one, uh, one minute to 30 seconds in that time frame. Since there's no 40 second option, I'll just go to the next smallest one and use 30 seconds. Now, after we run this, we can go back and check and see, oh, did we get any velocities higher than that? Uh, and if so, are we getting some instabilities? And then you can adjust it if you need to. But this is just a quick way to get yourself in the right range in the ballpark, as they say. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so hydrograph output interval, that's just going to uh, tell RAS how often you want to see flow and stage values provided in your DSS output. But the important thing for 2D areas is your mapping output interval. Um, I've got a one day simulation, five minutes into one day. That's going to be whatever uh, uh, 12 times 24 is. And so that's going to give me a lot of output intervals. So I'm just going to keep this at five minutes, but it doesn't hurt computationally anyway, as far as how long it takes to make this smaller, because what RAS does is it, it does all its mapping on the fly after the computation. So uh, there may be a little bit of extra time to write the DS or sorry, the HDF file in this case. But anyway, I think five minutes is going to be good here. We don't have to worry about the detailed output interval. That's just for 1D. Okay. I want to quickly go into the calculation and options and tolerances, because that's very important to check out before you do a 2D model. So go to options, calculation options and tolerances, and let's go to the 2D flow options tab. This is the one you always wanna think about. Okay, the, the default equation set that RAS uses for 2D areas is diffusion wave. And diffusion wave is a simplified version of the full momentum equation. So it doesn't apply everywhere. And full momentum is going to be most applicable, or it's going to be required, I would say, whenever you have significant accelerations, both convective and local accelerations. So if you have a steeply rising hydrograph, that's going to give you high local accelerations. If you have a lot of contraction and expansion of flow, that's going to give you a lot of convective acceleration. So if those things are prominent in your model, and they are prominent in most rivers, then you're gonna to wanna to use full momentum. But if you're just modeling an off-channel floodplain area, a storage area of some sort, and you're just trying to see the general movement of water and it's not really fast moving through, there's not a lot of acceleration or deceleration of flow, then you could probably get by with diffusion wave. And I would really encourage you to read up in the manual or uh, take, uh, take our class. And we talk a lot about the differences between diffusion wave and full momentum. So you can really understand what the best one is. I'm going to leave this as diffusion wave. Um, and usually I'll do that when I'm building my model too. And then if I do need to use full momentum, I'll switch at the very end after I've got a really well-built model. But I usually build it and test it in diffusion wave. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I think, yeah. I'll just add, Chris, um, this is obviously a really critical aspect of 2D modeling. Um, as Chris mm. just showed you, you can set up a 2D model extremely quickly. It's not hard to do. However, um, there are a number of things that are in, internal to the computations within HECRAS that make 2D modeling, um, that can make 2D modeling a little bit more difficult. And so it's really important to understand these kind of high level aspects of 2D modeling. And so like Chris said, reference the manual. I'd also encourage you to take our class. We really get into the nitty gritty when it comes to the equation sets and the theory behind these equations um, and, and when they're appropriate, when it's appropriate to use one equation set versus the other. Um, and we go into that quite a bit in our class. Yeah. 
Yeah, the other big difference between diffusion wave and full momentum is visually when you're looking in uh, RAS Mapper with diffusion wave, you're not going to see uh, separation zones and eddy patterns and little swirly flows here and there. Uh, you only get that with full momentum. It's not computed in diffusion wave. So if that's um, something you're expecting to see and you're not seeing it, make sure you've got full momentum turned on. So I'm going to click OK. Um, and we're going to run this thing. Cross your fingers, Ben. Mm -hmm. We're looking for all blue lines, no reds, no errors. I think everyone who's watching this wants to see the model crash because they'd be able to get some <laughs> troubleshooting out of it as well. So. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's probably true. Um, that was interesting. I thought I saw some negative time there, which would imply that there was some initial conditions, but I don't remember setting that. So I'm going to have to, uh, I think that might have been left over from a previous plan. So um, I'll take a look at that when it's done running. You can see here it's iterating on the 2D area. It gets as high as three or four, it looks like, iterations, which means it's not that there are there is some computational burden happening. Now it's resolving that burden, but the fact that it's iterating is making this take a lot longer. And so if that were an issue, um, the, the length of time, and you want to fix that, you can go in and see if you can find out why you're getting these iterations. It could be a current number thing. Uh, maybe my velocities are much higher than 10. But let's take a look at it and see what we get here. So I'm going to go to RAS Mapper. That's the best way to look at your 2D output. And I'm going to go to the new one that I just created under my results tab or results group. And that's this simple 2D area. So I'm going to and click on that. And when Chris, as Chris is opening that up, I'll just remind everybody, obviously, we're just going to kind of briefly overview the results here. But in episode uh, six of our Full Momentum uh, HEC RAS podcast series, we go in depth on viewing 2D output and all the different options that you have in that. So we're going to quickly overview this today just to get an idea of what our model, our 2D model yielded from a results standpoint. But we we'll definitely encourage everyone to check out episode six if they want to get more in depth on viewing 2D output. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I've got my velocity check, but I need to zoom or pan over to my area. And there's my area right here. And I can already see why I'm getting those errors, because look at the high velocities in here, approaching 15. That was uh, not expected. But um, and what's amazing is I was hoping to fill up this entire basin, but you can see it's all pretty well contained through there. Mm -hmm. So and here's a great example of an instability. So our model worked, it ran, and we didn't even get any reported errors, but we've got instabilities. And I know that because look at this pulsing happening as I animate it. Yep. Okay, that is that is an instability. And that can be solved almost always by having a better current number. And so my current numbers are probably pretty high. I'm gonna add a current number map and get an idea of how high they are. So I just went to add new results map layer, current number, Add map. Let's take a look at my current numbers in here. The highest one is up here. Yeah, they're it's not, not actually all that high. Bad. They're actually not bad, so I'm, I'm not quite sure why I'm getting this pulsing with my current numbers. You want your current numbers to be around one normally. I mean, there's a little bit of flexibility. They can be as high as three for diffusion wave, I think, but one is always a good target so i'm not quite sure unless it's really high up here yeah 1.63 is not that high but uh that's interesting it could be it's just so steep that it's having a tough time with it so um there's some high current numbers down here as well so let's try um let's try a better time step and see if that does it for us so i'm going to go down to 10 seconds and, um, you know, you could sit there and you could do some current number calculations and whatnot, or in the time it takes you to run some computations, you can just pick one that you think might work. So that's why I went to 10 seconds and I reran it. Now, notice already I'm not getting those same iterations. So I'm feeling pretty good about this 10 seconds right now that uh, hopefully that takes care of that pulsing issue. And, so um, 
Yeah. As this, as this is running, Chris, I just want to touch on a few other things that folks may want to consider when they're building 2D models. We're not going to touch on these today. And if you follow our, our HEC RAS podcast series, you'll note that we've already covered some of this information. But when you're building a 2D model, aside from just setting up the general geometry and the unsteady flow file and the plan file, um, you may, especially if you're doing this project for any type of consultation job, um, you may want to consider adding a Manning's N layer to your 2D mm -hmm. area, and then also yeah. um, brake lines and the refinement regions. Both of those are pretty fundamental when it comes to making uh, really, really high quality 2D models. Um, so if you want to learn more about those uh, individual items, I'd encourage you guys to check out some of the other episodes in our podcast series. Um, yeah, let's see if I turn on the Google hybrid map. Um, you can see this area is, you know, it's got some different land classification in here. It's pretty apparent. Um, I probably have transparency turned on, but you can kind of see there's some farmland. There's some um, um, urban areas in here, some towns, houses, and, and so forth. So you'd probably want to do exactly what Ben said is have a better Manning's End representation. But this is a simple example, so we're going to skip that today. Notice here, um, it took about 38 seconds longer, even though my time step was three times smaller. And that's because I didn't have these iterations here at all. So that's why it's uh, more efficient. Um, so let's close this. Let's take another look and see if we got rid of that pulsing. Go back to my velocity map. That's the one I, I always like to look at first because it, it really highlights where you might have hot spots. Okay, notice no more pulsing as I animate this. It, it And it achieves a steady state condition rather quickly, mm -hmm. probably within the first three hours. So I could probably trim this simulation down to three hours if I wanted to. Part of that and is you had some initial conditions time too, go Chris. That's true, that's true. Yeah, I forgot to look at that. But uh, check out the, uh, turn, turn on the um, uh, particle tracing here and you can, can get an idea of the direction of flow. Again, you're not gonna see any um, eddy patterns or anything like that with diffusion wave. Now there's a little bit of maybe leaking and or fragmentation going on here. And um, that gets into some refinements that you might wanna do with your 2D area. We're not gonna get into that today. We just wanted to show you how you can get a 2D model up and running. But Ben, if you were to, to do some more stuff on this, what, what are some things you might, besides the end values that you just talked about, what are some things you might consider to really uh, shape up this 2D area and get it really nice? Yeah, so Chris, why don't you, where you're at right now, go ahead and turn on your 2D grid so we can see yeah. kind of what our 2D grid looks like. So what I would do if I was kind of trying to improve this model is it's obvious that under a flow condition of 50,000 CFS, flow is pretty contained to that channel itself. And so what I would probably recommend doing is adding a refinement region that represents that um, channel portion of, of this, of this uh, river reach here and maybe drop the cell size down to something uh, much smaller, maybe uh, five or 10 feet. Um, to try mm -hmm. to really capture the the detail the detailed hydraulics within that channel. Now I'll note that it seems like based on the lidar data that we have here, it's not super super detailed. And so yeah. by dropping our cells down to something that small, we might not actually be capturing that much more detail because it doesn't look like our terrain is that high quality. And so this kind of gets into back into um, the discussion of you're going to be kind of limited based on the quality of your terrain as far as the level of detail you're going to be able to get out of your model. So um, yeah. I guess the first thing I would do is I was if I was modeling this particular river reach, I would probably try to find a more detailed uh, terrain data set uh, to give us give us a chance at really improving the model from a detail standpoint. Um, I yeah. then add, add the refinement region like we talked about. Uh, like Chris noted, it looks like there's some leaking going on that could probably be fixed by adding in some brake lines. Um, and again, all this stuff is, is items that we cover in depth in our class, as well as some of the previous podcasts that we've done. So I would encourage everybody, if you're interested in, in kind of learning about that, go back and listen to those. Um, we got, we have some really, really good dialogue. Uh, unfortunately, these podcasts, um, 
you know, you can't cover everything in them. So Chris did a great job right. of, of outlining how quick and easy it is to set up a 2D model. And while that is, uh, it's awesome for the user. It's, it's, it's very easy to do. And that's a good thing. Um, it can be a little bit dangerous because even though it's very easy to set up and run, uh, it's very easy to be tricked into pr thinking that you're producing a uh, high quality model and high quality output data. When in reality, there might be some underlying issues that you really need to um, you know, dive into before you report the results in any type of, of engineering setting. So. Yeah, and there there was that initial conditions time that was carried over from the previous one. So I I, I wouldn't need this for quasi steady. You don't need initial conditions time normally unless you have a one D two D connection. If there's any warm up time, you can get rid of that. There's no warm up time, so I'd probably do that and then run it again. And actually, we could we could cut it back to uh, just probably we'll just be safe and go four hours. And I'm gonna do this in full momentum now because I got a lot, of, lot more time to work with. And just to see if there's any difference, click OK. And, um, oh, uh, Coriolis effect. Oh, OK, so let me uncheck that option. So somewhere along the line, this got checked, this Coriolis effect. I don't want to look at Coriolis effect in this case, so I'm going to uncheck that. We'll go file save and rerun that. Oh, what do you think the over under is on this one minute? Mm -hmm. Well, it's full momentum, so it's you're gonna have some iterations. It's gonna take longer, some iterations, yeah. So yeah, here you can see what happens with full momentum. It's it's capturing all those acceleration terms. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot more um chance in the computations for errors but look at this now it's actually settled out and because this is a quasi steady model all i'm really worried about is the end of the simulation and so if it's able to get through those um you know that the, the water working its way through the system and once it equalizes if i've got zero iterations then i'm probably good is sebastian's calling <laughs> we'll call him back um Sebastian told me he wanted to get on the podcast, but I didn't know that was the way he was going to try and do it. All right. So um, here we go. We've done this in full momentum. And I think if I back animate this through, you might see a little bit of pulsing. Yeah, not bad, but it actually settles out real nicely. And now we've got a full momentum uh, model. And if there were some areas of separation and eddy patterns, you would be able to pick those up here with our uh, particle tracing, but I'm not really seeing those. It's yeah. not a whole lot of room for flow to uh, spread out and separate. So not too surprised about that. Cool, yeah. awesome. So what do you think? Pretty yeah. easy, right, Ben? Yeah, pretty easy. Uh, again, encourage folks to uh, to dive in more. There's a lot more to 2D modeling than just initially setting up, but I think Chris, you did a great job of outlining uh, those initial steps. and. Obviously, it's it's great for a RAS modeler to be able to to create a model that runs, be able to view some results, and then kind of take the next step into refining that model as needed. So, thanks, Chris. You are very welcome. Before we conclude today's podcast, I just want to plug our next upcoming 1D 2D RAS class. Uh, Chris and I are planning on hosting that online uh, once again. Um, the tentative dates for that are February 10th through March 17th. Um, those will be finalized here in the next week or two. So keep an eye out on our LinkedIn page for an announcement for that. We will also be, I'm sure, announcing that on our next podcast episode. But if you're interested in taking your HECRAS game to the next level, would highly encourage you guys to sign up for that class. Uh, we have a really good time and uh, we'll learn a lot about HECRAS over six weeks. It's a great, great, great course. So yeah, um, don't anybody. delay signing up. We had what about 50 people in our last one. We actually had to cap it. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested, get in early. Make sure you get a spot. Yep. If that springtime doesn't work, we'll probably have another one uh, sometime in the May June timeline. So keep an eye out for that as well. And uh, anything else, Chris, before we part for not only this episode but for the Thanksgiving week? Uh, just wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving. And if you're uh, in a place where you don't 
celebrate Thanksgiving. Just have a great weekend and a great upcoming holiday season. Sounds great. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. This has been episode 11 of Full Momentum and HEC Raz Vodcast. Until next time.